Hi everyone and welcome to chapter six. We are going to be talking about how cells harvest chemical energy. Um, so we already know that all cells need energy in order to function. So we are going to start today by looking at um, how cells use energy um, or how they obtain energy today. So let's look at how cells harvest their chemical energy. Um, with a new chapter, a new unit, comes a new objective. So we will be looking to understand that energy is stored, transferred, and transformed in living systems. This is a little bit of a bigger chapter, so we are going to kind of tackle it almost all in one video, and then we'll touch on fermentation, that last table of content item um, in a separate video. So we're going to start by talking about photosynthesis and respiration and how they are both responsible for providing energy for life. Two quick vocab words here. We have photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Photosynthesis is the process by which plants, algae, and some protists and prokaryotes convert light energy from the sun into chemical energy that gets stored in sugars that are made from carbon dioxide and water. Conversely, cellular respiration is an aerobic harvesting of energy from food molecules, usually from those food sources created by organisms performing photosynthesis, usually in the form of glucose, and then how they store that potential energy in a form that cells can later use to perform work. So life does require energy. We cannot do anything without our cells having energy. Energy first enters our ecosystem in the form of light from the sun. Photosynthesis converts that light energy into a sugar that can be easily broken down for cellular energy's use. And then cellular respiration breaks down that sugar even further into chemical energy that our cells use in the form of cellular energy. The two equations for photosynthesis and cellular respiration are kind of the opposite of each other. I will tell you right now, you will need to know this equation. Okay. The first equation is for photosynthesis. We have molecules of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere plus water from the environment with light inside a plant will yield a molecule of glucose and molecules of oxygen, which go back into the atmosphere. The equation for cellular respiration is the opposite of that of photosynthesis. So we take in that molecule of glucose and our oxygen from the atmosphere inside of our body produces molecules of carbon dioxide that gets released back out into the atmosphere, water, and energy. Let's look at the stages of cellular respiration. Glycolysis is a series of reactions that ultimately splits glucose into two smaller molecules called pyruvate. This is the first stage of cellular respiration and takes place within the cytoplasm of cells. We then have the oxidation of pyruvate, which makes a molecule called acetyl-CoA which releases carbon dioxide and produces a molecule called NADH that acts as an electron carrier. We have the citric acid cycle. This is a chemical cycle that completes the metabolic breakdown of glucose inside the mitochondria. If you remember, the mitochondria, although we like to call it the powerhouse of the cell, is actually the site of ATP production. We have oxidative phosphorylation. This is the production of ATP using energy derived from the redox reaction of the electron transport chain. Then we have something called chemiosmosis. 
This is the high energy coupling mechanism that uses energy from hydrogen ions that creates a gradient across the membrane inside the mitochondria that drives the production of ATP or drives cellular work. We break the stages of cellular respiration up into three different stages. First is glycolysis right here, shown in the greenish blue color, happens in the cytoplasm. Glucose gets broken down into pyruvate. It gets, that pyruvate gets oxidized by the addition of acetyl-CoA, which enters into our second stage, which is the citric acid cycle. Citric acid cycle makes molecules of NADH and something called FADH2. These are both electron carriers that carry their electrons to the electron transport chain, which is stage three, in total making upwards of 38 molecules of ATP for every one molecule of glucose. Chemiosmosis is the generation of a gradient of hydrogen ions that creates potential energy. This is done through active transport. So we do use a little bit of energy in the form of those electrons from NADH and FADH2 to push the hydrogen ions against their concentration gradient. Once we have created a gradient that has enough potential energy, diffusion of the hydrogen ions back through that mitochondrial membrane creates the ATP. Let's look a little bit closer at glycolysis. It happens in two phases. We have our energy harvesting phase and then our net gain phase. So in order to break a molecule of glucose, we actually have to use ATP to do so. So we have our molecule of glucose. We use two ATP to break it. The breaking of the glucose creates and releases two molecules of hydrogen, which act as the NADH on the electron carrier and produces four ATP in two citric or pyruvic acids or pyruvate. We only say though that we make two molecules of ATP because we had to use two in the process. The two phases, we have stage one, the energy investments, we have to add those two molecules of ATP to the reaction in order to convert that glucose into pyruvate. Then we get our energy payoff phase where we're making two molecules of ATP or two molecules of NADH and four molecules of ATP, netting two because we have to use two. And then we move into the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle where that pyruvate gets converted into citric acid and a lot of other intermediates um, whenever oxygen is present. And then the final step is that electron transport chain where we make all of our ATP. This is the citric acid cycle in its entirety. You don't really need to know all of these intermediates. What I need you to know is what goes in and what comes out. So we can see here, acetyl-CoA goes in. We get one, two, three molecules of NADH for every one molecule of pyruvate. So it's six for every one glucose. We get one, two carbon dioxides. So four in total. And we get two molecules of FADH2 for every one glucose. That's what I need you to know. What goes in and what comes out. We have a lot of stages to the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. So in stage one, pyruvate gets broken down and split into a two carbon molecule. That can then attach to that coenzyme A creating acetyl-CoA.
Step three is we create citric acid, where that nickname, citric acid cycle, comes from. This is a very short-lived molecule. It gets broken down quickly to make a molecule of NADH and a molecule of CO2, which is given off back into the environment as waste. The five carbon molecule created after citric acid gets broken down quickly in another molecule of NADH is formed. We create a molecule of ATP and another molecule of NADH is given off as waste. That four carbon molecule that we just created releases another NADH and an FADH2, which leave the cycle. Our products, we get three molecules of carbon dioxide, one ATP per pyruvate, four molecules of NADH, and one molecule of FADH2. The electron transport chain takes in water, the NADH and FADH2, ADP, which is the lower energy form of ATP, and makes ATP through a ATP synthase. The water is created through oxygen, which we breathe in, and the binding of a hydrogen ion after it diffuses back through the membrane. Water leaves our system as waste. The NADH and the FADH2 donate their hydrogen ions to create that chemiosmotic gradient and then move back to the earlier stages of cellular respiration. ADP enters to pick up molecules of phosphate to make ATP. After hydrogen diffuses through ATP synthase to create all of that ATP. So we see here it's a series of complex proteins. Hydrogen gets pumped, creating this gradient, which then comes back through ATP synthase, which makes ATP. We will pick up with fermentation in our next video.